101 Devadaha Sutta at Devadaha. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country where there was a town of Sakyans named Devadaha. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, because there are some recluses and Brahmins who hold such a doctrine and view as this, whatever this person feels, whether pleasure or pain, or neither pain nor pleasure, all that is caused by what was done in the past. So by annihilating with ascetism past actions and by Doing no fresh actions, there will be no consequences in the future. So no, consequ no consequences in the future, there is the destruction of action. With the destruction of action, there is the destruction of suffering. With the destruction of suffering, there is destruction of feeling. With the destruction of feeling, all suffering will be exhausted. So speak the Nigatan Svikus. Yeah, one thing about this, um, this is similar to the idea that all, kar kar all karma will inevitably bring its fruit. I guess it's not exactly the same, but it's in the same vein. And both are not what the Buddha taught. Because if karma necessarily brought about its result, then there would be no way to change, of course. So they're, they're both some form of determinism that no matter what you get, that's all because of some, it's predetermined because of some cause. What the Buddha said is that and, the, and this this really points to I've talked about this many many times in different ways, but the the important thing about karma is not trying to figure out why you're suffering the way you are today, or figure out what you may have done in the past, or or worrying about what results the things that you've done might bring or something. It's about seeing the nature of action. So what the Buddha said is that if an action, if a, an ethical, ethically charged action or state of mind is going to bring about a result, it can only bring about a result of the same kind. So if, if, if you act with an unwholesome mind, the result can only be, if it's going to, if it's going to bring a result, the result can only be unpleasant or on the side of suffering. And if you act or speak or think with a mind that is pure and, and wholesome, it can, the, only, the result can only be pleasant, but that's if there is an action. And, and it's, or if the result, that's if there is a result. And it's, there's many, many other reasons why there might not be a result. And, and the, 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 the importance of that is, is because it's practical. It, it, teaches us right and wrong and good and bad in the present moment. It's what you can see by paying attention. And it's how change comes about. You see what's wrong with the things that you're doing. You're not thinking about future, oh no, what will this? What, what have I done? What are the bad things that are going to come to me? You're not feeling bad about the past. Oh, what a terrible person I must have been. Right. A lot of the ways we look at karma are actually not very helpful or wholesome at all. This way is the Buddhist way, and it's the Buddha's take on karma. That we should look at our state of mind right now, and we'll start to see that this truth that mm, bad things are bad, they, they lead in a bad direction. You don't need an answer. What is the result of this karma? You don't have to worry about that. You just start to see the relationship how ah, bad things are a cause for bad things. Three, I go to the Nigantas who speak thus and I say, 
Friend Nigantas, is it true that you hold such a doctrine and views as this? Whatever this person feels that 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 all suffering will be exhausted. If when they are asked thus, the Nigantas admit this and say yes, I say to them, But friends, do you know that you existed in the past, and that it is not the case that you did not exist? No, friend. But friends, do you know that you did evil actions in the past and did not abstain from them? No, friend. But friends, do you know that you did such and such evil actions? No, friend. But friends, do you know that so much suffering has already been exhausted, or that so much suffering has still to be exhausted, or that when so much suffering has been exhausted, all suffering will have been exhausted? No, friend. But friends, do you know that what the abandoning of unwholesome states is and what the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now? No, friend. So, friends, it seems that you do not know that you existed in the past and that it is not the case that you did not exist or that you did evil actions in the past and did not abstain from them or that you did such and such evil actions or that so much suffering has already been exhausted or that so much suffering has still to be exhausted or that when so much suffering has been exhausted all suffering will have been exhausted or what the abandoning of unwholesome states is and what the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now that being so is it not fitting for the venerable nikantas to declare whatever this person feels whatever pleasure or pain or neither pleasure nor pain all that is caused by what was done in the past so by annihilating the aestheticism past actions and by doing no fresh actions there will be no consequence in the future with no consequence in the future all suffering will be exhausted if friend nikantas you knew that you existed in the past and that it is not the case that you did not exist or that you did evil deeds in the past and did not abstain from them or that you did such and such evil actions or that so much suffering has already been exhausted or that so much suffering has still to be exhausted or that when so much suffering has been exhausted all suffering will have been exhausted or what the abandoning of unwholesome states is and the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now that being so it would be fitting for the venerable nikantas to declare whatever this person feels etc uh, all suffering will be exhausted and nikantas suppose a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison and because of this he felt painful racking piercing feelings then his friends and companions kinsmen and relatives brought a surgeon the surgeon would cut around the opening of the wound with a knife probe for the arrow with a probe pull out the arrow and apply a medicinal powder to the opening of the wound and at each step the man would feel painful racking piercing feelings then on a later occasion when the wound was healed and covered with skin the man would be well and happy independent master of himself able to go where he likes he might think formerly i was pierced by an arrow thickly smeared with poison and because of this i felt painful racking piercing feelings then my friends and companions kinsmen and relatives brought a surgeon the surgeon cut around the opening of the wound with a knife probed for the arrow with a probe pulled out the arrow and applied a medicinal powder to the opening of the wound and at each step i felt painful racking piercing feelings but now that the wound is healed and covered with skin i am well and happy independent my own master able to go where i like so too friend nagantas if you knew that you existed in the past and that it is not the case that you did not exist or what the abandoning of unwholesome states is and what the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now 
That being so, it would be fitting for the Venerable Naganthus to declare, whatever this person feels, all suffering will be exhausted. But since, friend Naganthus, you do not know that you existed in the past, and that it is not the case that you did not exist, or what the abandoning of unwholesome states is, and what the cultivation of wholesome states is, here and now, it is not fitting for the Venerable Niganthas to declare, whatever this person feels, all suffering will be exhausted. When this was said, the Niganthas told me, Friend, the Nigantha Nataputta is omniscient, and all seeing and claims to have complete knowledge and vision thus. Whether I am walking or standing or asleep or awake, Knowledge and vision are continuously and uninterruptedly present to me. He says thus, Niganthas, you have done evil actions in the past. Exhaust them with the performance of piercing austerities. And when you are here and now restrained in body, speech and mind, that is doing no evil actions for the future. So by annihilating with asceticism past actions, and by doing no fresh actions, there will be no consequence in the future. With no consequence in the future, all suffering will be exhausted. We approve of and accept this, and so we are satisfied. When this was said, I told the Nigantas, There are five things, friend Nigantas, that may turn out in two different ways, here and now. What five? They are faith, approval, oral tradition, reasoned cog cogitation, and reflective acceptance of, of a view. These five things may turn out in two different ways, here and now. Irene, what kind of faith do the Venerable Nicantas have in a teacher who speak about the past? What kind of approval, what kind of oral tradition, what kind of reasoned cogitation cogitation, what kind of reflective acceptance of a view. Speaking thus, Bhikkhu, I did not see any legitimate defense of their position by the Nigantas. Again, Bhikkhus, I said to the Nigantas, what do you think, friend Nigantas, where there is intense exertion, intense striving, do you then feel painful, racking, piercing feelings? due to the intense exertion. But when there is no intense exertion, no intense striving, do you then not feel any painful raking, piercing feeling due to the intense exertion? When there is intense exertion, friend Gotama, intense striving, then we feel painful, racking, piercing feeling due to the intensive exertion. But when there is no intense exertion, no intense striving, then we do not feel any painful, racking, piercing feeling due to the intense exertion. So it seems, friend Nigantas, that when there is intense exertion, you feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion. But when there is no intense exertion, you do not feel any painful, wrecking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion. That being so, it is not fitting for the Venerable Nigantas to declare, whatever this person feels, whether pleasure or pain, or neither pain nor pleasure, all that is caused by what was done in the past. So by annihilating with ascetism, past actions, and by doing no fresh actions, there will be no consequence in the future. With no consequence, all suffering will be exhausted. If, friend Nigantas, when there was intense exertion, intense striving, then painful, racking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion were present, and when there was no intense exertion, no intense striving, then painful, racking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion were still present. That being so, it would be fitting for the Venerable Gigantas to declare whatever this person feels, all suffering will be exhausted. 
But since friend Nigantas, when there is intense exertion, intense striving, then you feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion. But when there is no intense exertion, no intense striving, then you do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to intense exertion. You are therefore feeling only the painful, racking, piercing feelings of your self-imposed exertion. And that is through ignorance, unknowing and delusion that you mistakenly hold. Whatever this person feels, all suffering will be exhausted. Speaking thus because I do not see any legit legitimate defense of their position by the Nigantas. Again, because I said to the Nigantas, what do you think, friend Nigantas? Is it possible that an action whose result is to be experienced here and now can, through the exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced in the next life? No, friend. But is it possible that an action whose result to be experienced in the next life can, through ex exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced here and now? No, friend. What do you think, friend Nigantas? Is it possible that an action whose result is to be experienced as present can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced as painful? No, friend. But is it possible that an action whose result <coughs> is to be experienced as painful can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced as pleasant? No, friend. What do you think, friend Nigantas? Is it possible that an action whose result is to be experienced in a matured personality can, by exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced in an unmatured personality? No, friend. But is it possible that an action whose result is to be experienced in an unmatured personality can, by exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced in a matured personality? No, friend. 19. What do you think, friend Igantas? Is it possible that an action whose result is to be much experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be little experienced? No, friend. But is it possible that an action whose result is to be little experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced? No, friend. What do you think, friend? Nigantas? Is it possible that an action whose result is to be experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is not to be experienced? No, friend. But is it possible that an action whose result is not to be experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced? No, friend. So it seems, friend Nigantas, that it is impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced here and now can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced in the next life, and impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced in the next life can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced here and now, impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced as pleasant and through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced as painful, and impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced as painful, can through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced as pleasant. Impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced in a mature personality, and by exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced in an unmatured personality and impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced in an unmatured personality 
can, through exertion and striving, become, become one whose result is to be experienced in a mature personality. Impossible that an action whose result is to be much experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be little experienced and impossible that an action whose result is to be little experienced, exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be much experienced. Impossible that an action whose result is to be experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is not to be experienced, and impossible that an action whose result is not to be experienced can, through exertion and striving, become one whose result is to be experienced. That being so, the Venerable Nigantas is fruitless. Bante, the terms exertion and striving here, uh, is it appropriate to use um, this same term when talking about mindfulness? Would you say mindfulness is also exertion and striving? Um. Um, yeah, the words can the word padana padana can be used. Um, upakama, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're they're pretty neutral terms. Okay. Okay. I mean he's kind of referring to the striving that these guys do, which is tapas, which is um, self torture or austerity or like extreme. Extreme exertion, overexertion, you might say, going crossing some lines. It is somewhat interesting that uh, he's he is implying a sort of rigidity here, but I don't think he's actually espousing these views. He's just saying, well, based on what you're saying, this is itikira, which means thus it seems. Uh, but it's um, it's interesting. There's a couple of things. Uh, the idea that a um, a bahuwe dunia kama can become a apawe dunia kama, or vice versa, mm -hmm. because there's always sort of been the idea that there is uh, well, there's upatambaka kama and upapilika kama, which uh, strengthen or weaken a karma, but there may be a more complicated explanation than that. And the other one is, uh, I, I believe the Sayada in Burma said that uh, when an arahant, when one becomes an arahant, any future life karma becomes dita dhamma vedaniya karma, becomes karma to be experienced in this life. But I think that's controversial. I don't really know. But uh, I don't think it's probably worth reading too much into this because he is saying itikira, he's basing it on a more general idea of karma not being influenced. The other thing is he's referring to um, exertion that really doesn't have anything to do with the, the ways in which karma can be influenced, the ways in which effects of karma can be changed. Right, like they, it doesn't have anything to do with the karma that was performed or the results that have been taking effect when you just torture yourself. Bante, I think uh, according to uh, the Abhidhamma, every karma has uh, Ditta Dhamma Vedriya part. Uh, the first Javana Chitta results in Ditta Dhamma Vedriya. So that part can be experienced by an Arhan, but not the other parts. Unless we are talking about uh, something done in the past, which is affecting this life. Yeah, well, you know the the quote about Angulimala, where the Buddha says he would have gone to hell, but instead he's suffering in this life because he became an arahant. Yeah, so he's suffering because of the Dhamma part of uh, the karma. Well, that's not what it seems to imply. But I'm pretty sure that this um, this. Burmi Sayada actually explained that karma to be experienced in future life becomes karma to be experienced in the present life. Karma doesn't have parts. There's just seven karmas in a, in a sequence. 
I guess that's a technical thing, but I don't think he was saying that all that's left over is the Dita Dhamma Vidinya Kama. I think he was actually saying that Kama that would have ripened in the future converts into present life karma. As as far as I understand this sutta is like he's trying to explain all all the kamas uh by their explaining that uh, because of their asceticism practice brings them pain now, here and now, right? That uh, the past and uh, that's not a result from a, from a past action, right? Right, he's going to talk about how absurd that is as well. Because if what they're saying is true, then this these horrible things they're doing to themselves now means, boy, you must have done a lot of bad karma in the past. But that's not what they're saying. They're yeah. saying by doing these things, they're expiating. They're, they're uh, paying for their karma as quickly as possible. They're not doing anything to avoid paying for the karma. So as a result, they will be free from karma when they die. Bhante, didn't the yeah, Bodhisattva did something similar? Bodhisattva just was trying to become enlightened and he thought mistakenly that torturing himself would do that, would dry up his mind because his mind was wet with the defilements so he could burn away the defilements. But this was due to past karma, right? The suffering he had to It go. was due to his wrong views that, yeah, his wrong idea, perversion, that, per, uh, corruption that was caused by something he did in the past. Also, self mortification is one of the popular uh, people who uh, search of enlightenment believe that they have to be So, he, he, the Bodhisattva tried that technique to see, to, to check whether this is, works or not. But he abandoned it. But regarding what Edith said earlier, so to give an example, if you are poking your hand with a needle, you feel the pain, and you don't feel any more pain. So what the pain is caused by what you are doing right now. It's not the a result of what 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 you did in a previous life. So that is the evidence that uh, you are not. Uh, uh, exhausting this time, you're just, uh, creating something here, right here and now. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just trying to understand how that fact, uh, you know, like doing something right now, which they are doing, let's say, causing themselves pain. So, there is a lot here actually that uh, I'm I, maybe I don't understand it yet. You know how how this example can uh, explain these type of types of karma that Bantin mentioned. Are you asking how they came about this view, or asking about the Buddha's explanation? Yeah, it's I'm confused about the Buddha's explanation. But maybe well, he's basically it's... saying it's basically just many different ways of saying that your exertion and striving has no effect on. Your past karma, that's all. Mm -hmm. he's, he's asking, well, in what way can you change their past karma? And he gives them all these different examples. Can you change it in this way or in that way? And they're like, well, no, that doesn't make any sense. Oh. All right, so these are just examples how they think uh, that they could ex uh, change their own karma or well, not necessarily own. he's just exhausting all the potential ways you might change karma it's, it's not clear what they think but he's just pointing out okay you say that this this exertion and striving that you do is gonna gonna work out all your karma in what way is it gonna change it in this way or in that way is it possible to change it? and it doesn't seem like it's possible to change it in any way so um, <laughs> what, what's what What's the deal here? Bhikkhus, 
And because the Nigantas speak thus, there are ten legitimate deductions from their assertions that provide ground for censuring them. One, if the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by what was done in the past, then the Nigantas surely must have done bad deeds in the past, since they now feel such painful, racking, piercing feelings. Two, if the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by the creative act of a supreme god, then the Nigantas surely must have been created by an evil supreme god, since they now feel such painful, racking, piercing feelings. 3. If the pleasure and pain by circumstance and nature, then the Nigantas surely must have bad luck, since they now feel such painful, racking, piercing feelings. 4. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by class among the six classes of birth, then the Nigantas class since they now feel such painful, racking, piercing feelings. 5. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by exertion here and now, then the Nigantas surely must strive badly here and now, since they now feel such painful, racking, piercing feelings. 6. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by what was done in the past, then the Nigantas are to be censured. If not, then the Nigantas are still to be censured. 7. If they are caused by the creative acts of a supreme god, then the Nigantas are to be censured. If not, they're still to be censured. 8. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by chance, then the Nigantas are to be censured. If not, they're still to be censured. 9. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by class, then the Nigantas are to be censured. If not, they're still to be censured. 10. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by exertion here and now, then the Nigantas are to be censured. If not, they're still to be censured. So speak the Nigantas bhikkhus, and because the Nigantas speak thus, these ten legitimate deductions from their assertions provide grounds for censuring them. Thus their exertion is fruitless, their striving is fruitless. Can I ask a question? Uh, does being censured mean that uh, they can be criticized? I was thinking about this part where it says if it's by chance, then they can be censured. I just didn't understand why if it's by chance, they can still be censured. Well, if, if it's by chance, they're, they're either, whether it's by chance or not by chance, their, their exertions are stupid or, or fruitless or meaningless, ill, r wrong, so stupid, it's not a very nice word, but whatever the word is, bad, worthy of censure. I mean, suppose it's by chance, then, uh, well, if it's by chance anyway, we can be clear that exer exerting yourself is not going to do anything. Then. Mm -hmm. So, worthy of censure. What is the exact word? Garaiha. God, I has, uh, well, the dictionary says contemptible. Hmm. To be bla uh, to be blamed. Garahati. Garaiha is a word that's used in the Patimoka in the Vinaya as well. Worthy of uh, to be blamed. How is exertion fruitful, Bikus? How is striving fruitful? Here, Bikus. A bhikkhu who is not overwhelmed with suffering does not overwhelm himself with suffering, and he does not give up the pleasure that accords with Dhamma, yet he is not infatuated with that pleasure. He knows thus, when I strive with determination of sufferings fades away in, my, in me because of that determined striving, and when I look on with equanimity, 
This particular source of suffering fades away in me while I'll develop equanimity. He strives with determination in regard to that particular source of suffering which fades away in him because of that determined striving. And he developed equanimity in regard to that particular source of suffering which fades away in him while he is developing equanimity. When in he strives with determination, such and such a source of suffering fades away in him because of that determined striving. Thus, that suffering is exhausted in him. When he looks on with equanimity, such and such a source of suffering fades away in him while he develops equanimity. Thus, that suffering is exhausted in him. Suppose, because a man loved a woman with his mind bound to her by intense desire and passion, he made a woman and a woman, chatting, joking, and laughing. What do you think, because would not sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise in that man when he sees that woman standing with another man, chatting, joking, and laughing? Yes, venerable sir. Why is that? Because that man loves that woman, with his mind bound to her by intense desire and passion. That is why sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair would arise in him when he sees her standing with another man, chatting, joking, and laughing. Then because the man might think, I love this woman with my mind bound to her by intense desire and passion. Does sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise in me when I see her standing with another man, chatting, joking, and laughing? What if I were to abandon my desire and lust for that woman? He would abandon his desire and lust for that woman. On a later occasion, he might see that woman standing with another man, chatting, joking, and laughing. What do you think, Bikus? Would sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise in that man when he sees that woman standing with another man? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because that man no longer loves that woman. That is why sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair do not arise in him when he sees that woman standing with another man. So do because when a bhikkhu who is not overwhelmed with suffering does not overwhelm himself with suffering, uh, thus that suffering is exhausted in him, thus because the exertion, exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. Again because a bhikkhu considers thus, while I live according to my pleasure, Unwholesome states increase in me and wholesome states diminish. But when I exert myself in what is painful, wholesome, what is painful, unwholesome states diminish in me and wholesome states increase. What if I exert myself in what is painful? He exerts himself in what is painful. When he does so, unwholesome states diminish in him and wholesome states increase. At a later time, he does not exert himself in what is painful. Why he who exerted himself in what is painful has been achieved. That is why at a later time, he does not exert himself in what is painful. So Bhante, the uh, comment says it's referring to the Dutangas, but how would we know that without it? Because the first time when I read it, I thought... Uh, What's the difference now if you purposefully uh, practice painful things, exert in painful things or whatever, it's, however you want to call it? It doesn't sound right. Is it the same in Pali? Tutangas are there to uh, 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 minimize the chances of uh, giving rise to divine. It's not a technique to uh, exhaust the uh, previous karma. Yes, I know, but this it's, it's not so obvious if you don't uh, read the comment on it. 
So if you just read pain, painful things, it's not really what I would think. I wouldn't think of yeah, that. That's why. Yeah, that's why the commentary is very helpful. I was also wondering about that phrase. Um, what does if I accept myself in what is painful mean here? Does that mean um, the sort of thing you do if you're a big or a big in that kind of exertions? You know, having all these rules and uh, practicing in For different. Example, let, let's say you are meditating and you have a pain in your uh, uh, legs. So instead of just uh, standing up and ch or changing your posture, you be mindful. You don't give in to pain. You become mindful of the pain. That is certain. because you haven't achieved what you are trying to achieve. So that is uh, that is a uh, that is a wholesome act. That is something useful. You know, it's a so. simple point when he's making. I don't overlook the simple idea here that. He's just saying that um, pleasure and pain are basically irrelevant. And it's a, it's a general principle that if you're doing something that is um, is challenging you in a way that leads to growth, that's a sort of a modern way of saying it, I guess. But as the Buddha said, it in a way, if it's something that is technically leading to the decrease in unwholesomeness and the increase in wholesomeness, then continue doing that regardless of whether you're feeling pleasure or pain i mean he's giving one iteration of it yeah when you if you if you see that pleasure is leading you to uh, to defilements then well you should maybe switch up a little bit and if you see that pain is um challenging you in a good way then uh, it's okay to continue in, in the way that is uh, painful I mean, it, yeah, it, it's a bit of a jump to suggest that he's saying, hurt yourself. He's not saying that. Just the way I uh, interpreted it is uh, that all growth, or not all growth, but a lot of growth comes from discomfort. And that discomfort in this paragraph seems like the right uh, direction to go towards. As, but as, he's kind as of in, not... He's not saying that it's something that people do say, oh, you have to suffer. It has to hurt if it's to heal, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. There's a Thai saying, man mai mi parami mai ke. Uh, without, without Mara, your perfections never mature. And, well, maybe actually that's not quite related. That's an interesting argument, to, to, to thing to discuss as well, but... It's a similar thing, the idea that it has to be painful. And the Buddha, I think it's important to understand the Buddha is not saying that here. I mean, that's explicitly what he's saying is different. He's saying sometimes a painful practice can be uh, really helpful. Sometimes pleasant practice can be uh, un unbeneficial. I mean, a pleasant circumstance is probably a better way of putting it. So if you're very comfortable sitting, but you see, well, I'm just kind of getting lazy, then maybe do something that's uh, going to potentially cause you suffering. Not because the suffering is uh, a good thing, but uh, the challenge is a good thing. The suffering is kind of irrelevant, except in that it uh, it, it challenges the mind, it forces the mind to let go. Like coming out of the, uh, moving out of the comfort zone kind of thing, what they say. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, not not just that, because sometimes going into your comfort zone can be helpful, right? If you're stressing over what is very painful, sometimes something more pleasant can be, and, and the other thing is can be temporarily beneficial, because eventually it's not going to mean much, whether it's painful or pleasant. But as he says, later he, he does not exert him in what is himself. And it's not in what is painful. Let's see here. Yeah, he's. It's that's kind of misleading to say in exerting himself in what is painful. It's with dukkha. Yeah, it couldn't be. It has to be with suffering. He exerts himself. Atanang. Atanang. What is atanang? Atanang. 
I forget. I think this is 2 1. He exerts the self with suffering, not in suffering. He exerts the self with suffering. It's kind of, but you, you could see it, and I, I mean, you know, you can read whatever you want in this, but it's, it's perfectly proper to read that as. Uh, grammatically as the suffering being incidental, like when you go to the forest with someone. And what does it say? And so and later, he doesn't exert himself with suffering. With suffering, not in suffering. This is, for me, it's like just while meditating, just understanding suffering. So the first understanding seeing seeing it clearly that this is suffering and this well, is he's making that, he's making it's yeah. a bit different he's making a point that sometimes it'll be painful sometimes it'll be pleasant remember what's the context of the conversation these guys are saying you have to torture yourself he's saying well sometimes when practice is painful when there is suffering that along with your practice that's a, that's you 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 benefit from that practice not directly from hurting yourself but the practice is painful and the practice that is painful is actually beneficial and sometimes when the practice comes along with pleasure the practice is beneficial. it can be because of the pleasure even because uh, you're attached to it another, another yeah, example but... is uh, when, when the Buddha when the Bodhisattva was uh, practicing self-mortification all the jhanic states disappeared that he had attained before and uh, he couldn't even focus right so painful states can be often unhelpful it's more of a this isn't to be seen as some kind of he's he, he's giving the opposite of a of a um, dogma of a of a doctrine here he's saying your doctrine that you have to torture yourself is wrong because practically speaking, a meditator will often benefit from practice that is pleasant, and sometimes they'll benefit from practice that is painful. It's not, and so again, I think in it's 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 not unless I'm reading this wrong, and I could be wrong, but it seems wrong and and helpful to clarify that it's not saying exerting himself in what is painful, he exerts himself with pain meaning the the practice happens to be painful almost incidentally or it just happens to be pleasant so Bhante, this is all mainly just physical right what we are talking about painful and there can be mental pleasure. pleasure that's wholesome but for the pain yeah it, it wouldn't be domanasa okay Okay, okay, I, uh, yeah, I misunderstood that part then. Yeah, well, they're not talking about domanasa either. They're not talking about mental suffering. They're talking about physical torture. Okay, they, so they, they I understand down, now. They lie down to starve themselves to death, and they stand out in the sun mm -hmm. and lie on a bed of nails. You know, this cliche that you see in old movies, uh, or cartoons we used to see where someone lies on a bed of nails, that was a thing they did. When I was young, uh, there was a science center and they had a bed of nails and you can actually lie on it and it's actually not uncomfortable. It's not? If you distribute your weight evenly across the nails, it uh, it's not. But over mm -hmm. time, I think, it, I think what it is is they lie on it for a long time and uh, they actually get... Uh, you know, indents in their skin and I don't know maybe eventually puncture wounds but it's slow I think so it's actually a feasible means of long-term torture because it takes time for it to actually I mean the, the nails can't be sharp obviously but uh, if they're not that sharp it just takes a long time for them to make indents and I guess eventually punctures anyway those are the things they were doing and it, they were pretty clear that it was that they were not going to uh, the, the goal was was to not be upset by them. I, th I mean, I think you'll see in their texts that they, they, their claim was that they were free from any kind of upset about it. 
I mean, in many ways, that's just because they're very weak. We still have people in here in Sri Lanka, Hindus, uh, who uh, uh, walk on fire and pierce their skin in front of the God, just to because they think that uh, if they punish themselves uh, in front of the God, they can. The God will not punish them. Well, you have Buddhists, um, Mahayana mostly, I think, who uh, who do things like that. There's a there was a a little bit different. Um, Ajahn Tong actually told this story about meeting a Vietnamese monk in in the UK, who, uh, as a as a means of paying homage to the Buddha, he used his baby finger as a candle, and he burnt his baby finger all the way to the stump uh, as a uh, as an as a sacrifice. And Ajahn Tong put it this way: He said, "You know." It was in front of all the villagers. It was the day he came back from his international trip, and in front of all the people in the village, in the town of, of Chom Tong, he said, you know, I think if anybody here, any of our, our community, you know, had to do that, they, they would, what did he say? He said, I don't, think they'd, I don't think they'd ever be able to do something like that. We can't, he said, we can't compare to that. Nobody here would ever have that but kind Was of, it valuable? Well, he praised. He was praising the uh, the conviction. He said, "I don't think anybody here has that much conviction." I mean, I don't see the meaning of that. I mean, that. Well, that's impressive. Most people couldn't do such a thing. He, what he was, the way he put it is, uh, this guy must have had some pretty intense concentration. He, his 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 power of mind. That's quite impressive that he was able to do it without uh, flinching or stopping. He had to be able to really control his mind. Yeah, so there was a monk in Sri Lanka who set himself on fire uh, protesting uh, the slaughterhouses. He demanded that the government make it illegal <laughs> or he will burn himself. Nobody cared, so he burned himself to death. It is possible. I mean, that that could just happen out of conviction, but it is possible sometimes that people have mental illness and take things the wrong way based on some kind of craziness. We had a monk who was originally from Tibet. Well, he's originally American, but he ordained originally in Tibet, in Nepal maybe. And then came back to his 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 Tibetan teachers refused to teach him and sent him to uh, to Thailand to learn the basics first and then come back and learn the advanced stuff. And he went crazy. I think mostly, well, I think he was somewhat schizophrenic. Actually, he had mental illness, so that was the real reason. There's no other. But but he really struggled with straddling these two traditions. Like he memorized. He was really smart, actually. He memorized parts of, the, or maybe all of the Visuddhimagga, as well as the Abhidharma Kosha, which is an Abhi, uh, a Mahayana text. Anyway, he he lit himself on fire eventually. He survived, apparently. But uh, poured gasoline on himself or something. Poured something what on himself that, that, that couldn't kill him. Uh, it was supposed to lead to enlightenment, I think. See, the voices in his head were telling him to do it. These are tragic stories, I think. People with pre-existing conditions who just uh, didn't get uh, proper guidance and um, yeah, yeah, he he didn't. So, I think he didn't quite get the guidance he needed. But also, there are some people who are seriously um, receiving guidance from within, which is pretty much delusional and there's not it's hard to compete with that I mean I talked to him on, on several occasions he wouldn't really listen to me and I probably didn't give him the best advice I was just a new monk but um, it was clear that the things inside I think some of what I said some of what, not I but some of what we said like there were several of us there was all sorts of people giving him assurance and guidance and advice and stuff and I think some of it helped him to stay somewhat grounded 
just hearing from people outside of his own head. But yeah, it was he was such a nice guy too. He was honestly very thoughtful. He knew so much. Like I I I underestimated him and thought he was just crazy and knew nothing. But then I heard him recite. He was asked to recite a teaching, not recite, but explain the teaching, and he explained it so perfectly. Like he he had this he had it basically not just memorized but understood intellectually. And he was a powerful meditator. He was he was a he also kept the uh, ascetic practices. He even wanted to wear a rags robe. He had a, he had made a robe out of rags at one point, which is very rare. And they wouldn't let him wear it because, uh, yeah, well, they want you to look pretty. They want you to look nice in Thailand. You have to look more like a priest, I think. Number 28, suppose because an arrow smith were warming and heating an arrow shaft, arrow shaft between two flames, making it straight and workable, when the arrow shaft had been warmed and heated between the two flames and had been made straight and workable. Then at a later time, he would not again warm and heat the arrow shaft and make it straight and workable. Why is that? The purpose for which that arrowsmith had warmed and heated the arrow and made it straight and workable has been achieved. That is why at a later time, he would not again warm and heat the arrow heat the arrow shaft and make it straight and workable. So too, a bhikkhu considers thus, as in 27 above, 200 and 226, etc. That is why at a later time he does not exert himself in that. In That is why at a later time he does not exert himself in what is painful, Thus too, because the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. Again, because here a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened, as Sutta 51, he purifies his mind from doubt. I guess I need to go to Sutta 51. Let's just finish this one. Okay. If we can. Sure. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfection of the mind that we can miss them, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Thus too because the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. Again, because with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu mm -hmm. enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Thus too, bhikkhus, the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. Again, bhikkhus, with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity, and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. Thus too, because the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. Again, because with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Bhikkhu enters and enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which is neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Thus too, because the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. 
recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, as in Suda 51, section 24, thus with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. Thus, too, bhikkhus, the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. 42. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, read of imperfection, malleable, weighty, steady, and attend to imperturbability, imperturbability, he directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, as Sutta 51, 40, uh, 24, thus with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives, thus too, because the exertion is fruitful and the striving is fruitful. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, with of imperfection, malleable, wealthy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to knowledge of the passing away and the appearance of beings. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Thus, too, bhikkhus, the exertion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wealthy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the taints. This is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated from the when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands. Both is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Thus too, because the extortion is fruitful, the striving is fruitful. So the Tathagata speaks because, and because the, the Tathagata speaks thus, there are ten legitimate grounds for praising him. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by what was done in the past, then the Tathagata surely must have done good deeds in the past, since he now feels such taintless, pleasant feelings. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by the creative act of a supreme god, then the Tathagata surely must have been created by a good supreme god, since he now feels such taintless, pleasant feelings. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by circumstance and nature, then the Tathagata surely must have good luck, since he now feels such taintless, pleasant feelings. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by class among the six classes of birth, then the Tathagata surely must belong to a good class, since he now feels such taintless, pleasant feelings. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by exertion here and now, then the Tathagata surely must strive well here and now, since he now feels such taintless, pleasant feelings. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by what was done in the past, then the Tathagata must, is to be praised. If not, then the Tathagata is still to be praised. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by the creative act of the Supreme God, then the Tathagata is to be praised. If not, the Tathagata is still to be praised. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by chance, then the Tathagata is to be praised. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by class, then the Tathagata is to be praised. 
If not, the Tathagata is still to be praised. If the pleasure and pain that beings feel are caused by exertion here and now, then the Tathagata is to be praised. If not, then the Tathagata is still to be praised. So the Tathagata speaks bhikkhus, and because the Tathagata speaks thus, there, uh, there are ten legitimate grounds for praising him. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. Bhante, I think you've mentioned that it's not the actions but the state of mind um, that you know um, lead to certain types of karma, I guess, or results. I just wonder, you know, with this thing where people do good deeds or make merits, what state of mind, you know, makes this good deeds? Like, what kind of state of mind come up when people are doing something? Um, that's called, you know, uh, that, you know, you can say is meritable. What, what states of mind are, are, are good, did you say, are you asking? Yes, let's say you, you give dana or you help somebody in the streets. I'm just trying to figure out what kind of state of mind is there that can be, you know, called a wholesome state of mind. Well, the big, the root one there is actually um, the the sacrifice, the the letting go, the inclination to um, to give up something of value. So, in fact, um, just giving up and not actually giving anyone anything to anyone is uh, is is just as valid. But there are others. There's kindness. There's there's thoughtfulness. Um, the the ability to recognize what what is proper in the sense that this person needs this thing, because you see, we don't give things to people who need them because of stinginess, or just because of some kind of delusion of some sort, or even ignorance, not noticing. You know how in families, like in husband and wife, the husband won't recognize what the wife is doing that sort of thing, or taking each other for granted. Um, so recognizing, well, that's, that's actually not the same, but recognizing what people need also, but also recognizing what people have done for you, but that's not right. More recognizing, if you if you walk past someone who's begging in the street, uh, and you, you don't give, it's often, well, maybe you weren't paying attention. Or uh, you come up with some idea of how it's better not to give, or that sort of thing. So there's lots of there's lots of goodness gen just around the fact that it's right. But you know, people will say things like kindness, compassion, friendliness, and all of that's right. Uh, p p potential to come up thinking of, oh, this will make this person happy, is a friendly thing. It's mundane. I mean, uh, friendliness is, is, is helpful, but actually not a part of the path. So okay, it can yeah. still get caught up in, you can still get caught up in you know, going to heaven instead of becoming enlightened, but still generally good and helpful. It, they're the kind of things that make you feel good about yourself, so they lead to like genuinely feel reassured about yourself so you don't feel guilty, so you don't hate yourself. And that can be very helpful for uh, meditation, of course, if you have confidence as a result. Okay, yeah, I was wondering if you could really say somebody is free from, you know, greed, delusion or hate when they're helping. Uh, but it's, it's it sounds like it's, you know, uh, totally different from, let's say, if you're being mindful and having sati, you can say for sure in those moments. The thing is, a person who is lots of sati, who is very mindful, is much more likely to help when it's appropriate and not help when it's not appropriate. Sometimes people meddle, right? Or are very keen to find people to help or that sort of thing. And, and it can be good, actually, but they go out of their way and 
are not mindful. It's not coming from a place of mindfulness. A mindful person is not trying to change the world because it can't be done. You can help. You can spend your whole life helping people and still find there's more people to help. So it's a good good strategy to always just check if you uh, one that what you mentioned the mindfulness, but also just check is there greed and delusion right here and now and then just change it with, with mindfulness and just proceed if you want to help yeah. when you're offering offering uh, arms uh, all three wholesome roots can be involved that makes it a triple rooted karma we have mm -hmm. metta appreciation uh, friendliness, like Pante said, and then you know that this is a beneficial act for both you and the other person, that you you have a knowledge of karma. The yeah, we, well, and, and letting go. One thing we often miss, Pema Siri Hamduro said said this, I happened to be there when he was giving a talk, and he said, you know, chaga, this chaga we call generosity, but it's not generosity. And he went on, I think maybe made a little too much out of it, but he said something about how it was the important thing about chaga. Chaga is about the giving up. And uh, it's an, it's a part of, I think he talked about how giving is, is we all don't realize how powerful it is, the, the giving up. You, that's why I think Vesantara is such a challenging, it challenges people. It's so memorable because it really resonates. I could never do that. I could never give up everything I own. Like, it's so powerful to people because how it resonates. With, it makes you see your own greed. I, I, okay, I, I like giving, but I, I want some stuff for myself still. But no, Oisantara was like, he came out of the womb and said, Mother, is there something to give? I want to give alms. And he just gave everything he owned away. Absolutely everything. A tough parami to develop, I think. Like even even if you just want to give food, like um, if you give everything, then maybe you won't have what yeah, to these, eat. These examples of uh, where people would give their their meal, like that's what struck me so much. Yeah. So right in in Colombo, people would stop on their motorcycles and give me their lunch for the day. I mean, they could of course go and buy another lunch, and probably many of them did, but it's still quite powerful that you're giving me the food, giving someone else the food that, that, that you prepared for yourself, that that was uh, something that you were anticipating. It's a, yeah, I, it's a powerful I remember a, I remember a story of a slave girl who had like just very rough uh, rice or something and uh, she was thinking oh this is my only meal for the day and but i but this is still a very good opportunity to give it to the buddha so she did she was wondering if the buddha will accept accept it even but it's um Along the lines of not just doing things which are self-serving and trying to increase your own pleasure. Well, that's a little more of a worldly way of looking at it. Because the better thing is to do it because it's good for you. I mean, not you really, but because it's the right thing for a being to do, because it's a thing that leads a being to better, to betterment. It leads to betterment. You don't really, you aren't really thought to gain much benefit from focusing on other people, e except in the sense that thinking, being thoughtful and considerate is good for you, is is or is is the right thing to do. It's about doing the right thing, really. That's why mindfulness is. You don't have to want to be mindful. It's just the right thing to do. Okay. I th I also think like it it was a very very powerful and very important question uh, cheese question like how do I know if uh, my mind is in is uh, wholesome yeah 
But I think mm-hmm. that's what we all have to ask every time like, ourselves. Okay, okay. Is it? Is it? But but also what Bante mentioned, the letting go part. That's so. I mean, that's. I think many many don't understand yet how to give. I think I think you you. It's just something we don't talk about much. But I think you feel it. It's the it's this kind of welcome challenge where you you feel oh but I want this for myself. You're like oh okay this is a growth thing this is a hard thing and so it's part of what makes giving fulfilling I think. Well, sometimes sometimes people get just very excited about giving and looking goody goody and uh you know being praised and stuff like that so it's it's very different from what you are talking about just letting go so i i was saying uh, maybe it's a separate uh, topic slightly but i wondered with this view of the niganthas if people could have as if you like this but around giving they think by giving they can exhaust past karma yeah, that is true. There's a lot of um, fear-based giving, like uh, you give because people in, in Buddhist cultures will give when bad things happen to them. In Thailand, I, I, I'm not, can't think off the top of my head about Sri Lanka, but in Thailand, Sanka can probably say, but in Thailand, uh, it was common if bad things happen, they'll think, oh no, I have, to, I really better go to the monastery and and they have terms for it that are really not very Buddhist. Um, so they're they're very fixated on on uh, sort of you know aptly stated because sort of what these like these nigantas doing something to expiate their karma to chai kam they call it chai kam, uh, which mean and there's there's books written on. Is chastising this. I, I read, I tried to read a book about explaining, and it kind of was eye-opening because I didn't realize that it was a big thing. But it was criticizing this Thai practice of uh, doing something to to get rid of the kama, to prevent the results. Hey, do you remember this book? Oh, it was just a Thai book. I mean, these are just so some monastery prints up a thing. Ranting about some. That's actually Bante. Uh, some, some that that is Bante. That's that is somewhat supported, uh, right, Bante? Because uh, there are like uh, four things uh, affecting the uh, results of karma: kal sampati, gati sampati, padi sampati, and payoga sampati. But you can actually do good deeds so the past bad deeds won't get a chance to give results something I, I like think, that right? I think I think a more important point is uh, whether whether or not that's right or wrong is that generally speaking fixating on doing something in order to prevent bad things from happening to you is um, problematic mm. well Probably most likely bound up in fear, greed, uh, greed because of the attachment to your stability. You're afraid of loss. You're afraid of these sorts of things. So you, it, it's a very different attitude from someone who is letting go or has let go, who isn't worried about losing things, who isn't worried about, uh, so isn't doing things to try and keep or to try and get. People rich people will often give because they've heard the narrative that that's how they got rich and so they'll do it as a means of staying rich and it's not that that's not true to some extent um, it's two things one that it's probably not very powerful because of the the effect the the intent right when they became rich the yeah. first time they probably or they hopefully or they may be they likely had a more pure mind, but when they're doing it now just to keep the things that they love, it's not a very pure mind, so it's not a very strong thing. Um, 
But the other thing is that it's, it's of course, also the wrong reason for doing anything. I mean, the wrong thing to aim for in the first place, getting rich and keeping the things you like. Yeah, so far, so far what I read uh, as, as Dhamma, I never seen anything like what Sankha is saying that the Buddha had thought that the, this is the way for you to prevent this or that or um, to make more of your good good fortune or something. Practices. Even, even angels do that. I have heard a story uh, of when uh, Varabha Sariputta, I think it was Varabha Sariputta, or Varabha uh, Mahakasapa. He was uh, uh, in Nirodha Samapati for seven days. So after seven days, he got up and uh, he went for arms round. But he thought, uh, uh, let me find someone who is poor. So this uh, and receive the honor from that person. So that uh, merit will help that person very much. But uh, angels saw that. Uh, uh Venerable has uh, entered his meditation and uh, going on arms round. So they came and offered uh, arms, but uh, the Venerable rejected it. Uh, uh, but then uh, they appeared themselves as a poor person and uh, offered dana. Then the Venerable accepted it. And he said, hey, you've tricked me. And they said, well, we're poor too. <laughs> Angels are poor yeah. too because we don't have yeah. merit. We don't have an opportunity but, to do good merit, good deeds. But that's good also good. very good, right? Like a deception and, uh, and, and just taking uh, away someone else's opportunity. I feel, I mean, it's, it's tainted. Well, their argument that, is they don't, they don't have an opportunity. They're they're in big trouble. People apparently you can go. F there is a story where the, these angels went from the angel world to hell, and I think Mahasi Sayadaw said that it's actually not technically possible, but probably they went to the human realm for. I don't know. Can an angel go straight to hell? I'm not sure. Uh, Brahmas yes, cannot go. Angel can. Yeah, huh? Brahmas. Angels can. Brahmas can. Okay. So, the, I mean, if these angels realize that. They're in a bad way. They better do something. They don't have much opportunity to do good deeds. They said. For, for example, the Mara Dusi. One example is Mara Dusi when uh, he it uh, injured one of the chief disciples of uh, uh, Buddha Kasapa. He right. went to hell immediately. Right. The Lawar, you were saying. Sorry. No, no, I, I just mentioned that uh, angels are also way greedier than humans. Well, but, certainly not all. Many angels are not greedy at you, all. You said people. greedier? What? But that, that's what I read from, I think, Mahasi said. Or something mm, like that. Yeah, no, many are not. Many are quite angelic. Uh, yeah, I can believe that. <laughs> but many are very greedy. Yeah, for sure. They get very much intoxicated by the pleasure but so the issue here is being too fixated on this and um uh, losing sight of the real point fixated on what on you know on trying to control karma and not doing not actually freeing yourself but relying on um yeah merit making yeah, I would argue that um, really what the Buddha's probably thinking of, I mean, not to put words in his mouth or explain it, but my, I would I would think that it's more along the lines of that Bayoga, what is it, Bayoga Sampati? Bayoga Sampati. It's more along the lines of if you, for example, practice Satipatthana Vipassana, then that's going to affect a lot of karma, a lot of the effects that you might have felt otherwise of karma. It's going to change uh, your fate or your destiny. It's going to change a lot about your life. And so you see, that's an example of working really hard, but not working really hard to prevent bad things from happening, but working really hard in such a way 
that bad things don't happen, not because that was your intent, right? It's it's a, it w and and if instead you're focused on not making bad things happen, well, you can never be mindful. For example, it would never be as effective as that. But it's probably even worse. Like it's tainted with desire. It's tainted with fear. It's tainted with all sorts of things. Hmm. So if you're and and it's it's seen most explicit. I mean, well, I see it most explicitly in meditators who are constantly asking. Uh, what can I expect from the practice? What are what what? Uh, how do I know I'm pro progressing? Um, why don't I feel any different? Why don't I? Why am I not experiencing any fruit? That sort of thing. Uh, questions that belie a fixation on results. They're doing it for something, and that's. Uh, but you can clearly see they're not very mindful as a result. There's a lot of doubt uh, and and the underlying fear and 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 craving. Bante, the the exertion with with pain is it is it like a right effort? Um, remember, there's two kinds of right effort. There's noble, and then there's pubanga, and there's the preliminary. So. In preliminary, is, right, is four things. It's uh, yes, nothing to do with pain, right? Yeah. I was wondering about satipatthana and letting go, and um, let's say that by doing meditation, you stop seeing beauty in nature. And we say this is a result of um, of seeing clearly, no? What does it mean to see beauty in nature? Like sometimes I, maybe I'm wrong, but sometimes I feel that um, beauty in nature is something objective that we just um, that we just recognize. It's not something that we we superimpose. Well, is the, then let me ask you: Is the is the beauty physical or is it mental? Because in that's all that exists in ob objectively, physical and mental. <laughs> Sorry. Well, maybe in nature has a mental aspect to it. I mean, maybe it's mental, but it's not just in our mind. I mean, we recognize the mental in, in, in the, nature. In nature's in, mind. May, yeah, yes, that then this be true. Nature has a mind. Like, why well, is I, nature I, is nature does nature have physical component, mental components, or just physical components? So I, I don't know if we if we use the term spiritual in the in this sense, but component to it also. And no, we don't admit such a third component. Either you're talking about something mental or you're talking about something physical. Those are the only things that exist in ultimate reality. So when we stop perceiving uh, beauty in nature, um, how can we rule out that we fail to perceive something that is really there? That's, that's the thing what I am asking. If nature has a mental aspect to it, when I said spiritual, I meant something mental. Well, you can't experience someone else's mental uh, part. You only, you only experience things through... I mean, I guess there are technically ways to read other people's minds or, or read their emotions or that sort of thing. Feel, em empathize in the sense of feeling the emotions of others. But that's still happening in your own mind. And nature doesn't have a mind like that. Nature is not actually a thing. So I guess we should even go further back and ask, what do you mean by nature? Because nature is not a thing that exists. Uh, there are living, let's say, living things like grass, trees, rabbits. They seem to have... Maybe I'm wrong and... Um, I'm sure that you will think I'm wrong, but they seem to have some uh, 
some beauty that is independent, a form of beauty that is independent of our, um, it's in, in independent of our recognizing it. Well, to let you off the hook a little bit, um, there's there's patterns, and patterns are are often uh, a sign of or no, a consequence of of either wholesome activities or unwholesome activities. So, why nature seems beautiful in a way that. Um, a nuclear a nuclear waste dump doesn't is because it's a, a product of something something a lot simpler um, and I, I think that resonates with human beings but it's all you're not off the hook because it's all just how we perceive it two people can look at the same thing and one person finds it beautiful and the other person finds it ugly the thing that made made me think about this was that just by sitting, let's say we think about a field with flowers and we feel it's beautiful and we sit and say to ourselves, feeling, feeling or imagining, imagining. Liking, liking because that's probably like, a part like, of what we mean by beautiful. It is something that I like. There's an objective. I, I said if, so I'm not saying this is true, I'm just, I'm just speculating. If there's um, objective beauty behind the field with flowers, then how can we, how can we see clearly, how can we see clearly if there is or there isn't an objective beauty just by analyzing our own mental activities? Right, yeah. just by being, not analyzing, just by being mindful. I mean, the truth is, once you're mindful, that beauty, that perception of beauty will disappear. You'll see that it was actually not, I mean, beauty is not something that was there in the first place. You don't perceive something as beautiful, you like it. Um, I mean, I guess, you, you, as I said, it can resonate in such a way as to create a sort of um, pleasure or peace in the mind. Right, it's very peaceful to be in nature. Why? Because it's very it resonates. It, it resonates is maybe too strong a word, but the way the perceptions, the sights and the sounds, the, the experiences of seeing and hearing, and smelling and tasting and feeling are very simple, uh, very um, simple in in how they how we react, how we resonate with them. So our experience of it is is very pleasant result and it's those things that make us say oh this is so beautiful but you can't explain or point to something as being an experience of beauty it's liking or it's the this it's i mean it starts generally with the feeling of pleasure or peace that comes from the experience like symmetrical babies apparently are much attracted to people to parents who have or adults who have symmetrical faces or something like that it's how they were saying we we grow up thinking of beauty when someone's face is symmetrical, whatever that means. I don't really understand it, but apparently that's a thing. Symmetry and that sort of thing. But we... Some countries, in another example is in some countries, people think that if there's a gap between the front teeth, that's beautiful. But uh, I personally find this he find it hideous. Well, and... and um, some people find uh, human beings of a certain ethnicity more beautiful than of another ethnicity, uh, and and more glaring. Uh, dogs find other dogs attractive, and well, generally humans do not. But but even more glaringly, like insects find each other attractive. Uh, it's maybe going far afield because now we're talking about attraction, but it it dovetails because. The same goes for beauty. In um, uh, there's the idea of of uh, fatter or thinner, and it, and it chain and uh, body weight, not fatter. Body weight is a sign of beauty that changes over time. So if you look at throughout history, um, 
whiteness is um, we'll call it skin skin darkness. Some people find a tan skin right more attractive or more more beautiful. I think is fair to say, and we'll see pale skin as as ugly, and others find pale skin just beautiful. But we feel such an that it's so wholesome to recognize beauty in the outer world that it seems almost a sacrilege to do an activity that leads to the Well, abandoned. I think you're just talking in circles and I've already given you the answer. Beauty is not something yes, that yes. exists, so I think this is yes. there's there's no going any further here. You're, it doesn't exist objectively and if you are mindful I mean it it just there's not really any logical argument for it besides besides saying I feel like it exists. Yes, yes, I just pay attention just, and you'll see that. What are I you even talking that, about my beauty? I just said that the feeling is very intense. I, mm. I, I didn't want to imply that I, that the, the view that I exposed is right. right. That the view that I was talking about is right. Yeah, well, it's a good observation. I mean, even more so in regards to how we treat humans, uh, fellow humans, or uh, as far as attraction goes. It can be incredibly intense. But uh, but yeah, not exactly what you're talking about. Like the beauty of nature is so... Like if we, some people are born ugly, some people are born beautiful because of karma, different karma, bad karma, or lack of uh, good, uh, I mean, holes in the karma. Oh, weak karma. There's that, but still, it's uh, ultimately what you are perceiving is a concept. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, that's the sense in which beauty is objective. It's physical, but it's a physical manifestation of wholesomeness as opposed to unwholesomeness. Mm -hmm. And and how it's different is it's more again more peaceful, more pleasing. It just shows. Um, it radiates happiness and uh, kindness and goodness and just um, yeah yeah symmetry. Yeah. Like why someone might be asym? I don't I don't really understand it, but apparently our faces can be asymmetrical, and that's probably a sign of some corruption in the mind that distorted it. You know, it's just past stuff, but yeah, it's all physical. I just wanted to mention that uh, to me, it's like when I see uh, people very kind or generous and or just very developed uh, meditator, I find them very beautiful, if I may say. Yeah, it starts to show. Weren't we talking about this recently, how it starts to show up uh, physically? Like you'll see it, an angry person starts to take on a different facial structure even. One benefits of uh, loving kindness meditation. So if you are mindful, you are naturally uh, less angry. I mean, people who are practicing loving kindness just because they, you know, they are angry or hurting or something, uh, I mean, that's also like, it's visible, you know, they, it doesn't change them, I don't think. They, they still seem like, seem like troubled to me, at least. Well, if they are still troubled, it's probably not the right type of meditation for the personality, or they are not practicing well. <laughs> The idea of nature being uh, perhaps subjectively beautiful. I, ha I had this question actually, Bante, when I watched your video. I never thought of it, but I, I think in this video you said the Buddha uh, said monks go to the forest. So when I first watched you saying this, I, I, I wondered, is there something special about the forests that I'm missing? Uh, but yeah, it seems like it's more that it's conducive to your practice rather than there's any real uh, inherent beauty in it. 
Well, I think that, I mean, it dovetails, but I think better to be explained as um, the simple aspect of what we often call beauty, like the beauty of nature. Some people hate nature. They can't stay in it because it's not enough. It's not immediate. There's no immediate gratification. Nature is not that beautiful. I mean, in fact, being in nature is not generally as pleasant as we often romanticize it. There's mosquitoes, there's snakes, there's leeches, depending where you are. I mean, I've lived in so many different natures and all around the world, and, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> but um, what it does have is it has a simplicity to it. There's there's not the constant aggravation and complexity um, uh, of, say, cars honking, brakes screeching, um, people talking, of course, but that's going quite extreme. Uh, even just the sights of the city, which are all jarring and, and incongruous. It, it's more taxing on, on the brain to figure out what's going on when you look at buildings, as opposed to figure out what's going on when you look at a tree. Also probably because, not just because of the simplicity and the elegance in a sense, but also because if we've been on this earth for a, a long time, we've spent a lot more time, even the human species has spent a lot more time in around trees than they have around concrete buildings or steel buildings or plastic and that sort of thing. So it's it's familiar, it's easy to assimilate, easy to process. And those sorts of things help, especially with samatha practice, um, to keep the mind focused and calm, stable. Vipassana gets a little bit uh, off gets what's the word gets um, a little bit of a pass on that because uh, there's not such a need for the stability of mind the, the the firmness of mind not in the beginning anyway I heard that Buddha went into into the forest to meditate because the reality of living in a forest constantly reminds you of your own death, of the possibility and imminence of your own death. Anyway, the the meaning the meaning was, or the question is that uh, is is there in Sri Lanka and Thailand and all these uh, big Buddhist uh, country countries still have like very um, holy persons, holy monks and uh, like true nobles, that I guess that's my question. Do they still have the true Dhamma? Not just, not just uh, in traditional Buddhist countries, but nowadays, uh, possibly in the West as well. Yeah, so that that was uh, controversial to me because I heard that oh, only in the West now, you know, and I was like, no way, Thailand doesn't have you know these holy people or Sri Lanka. Where, where did you hear that? Only in the West there's true Dhamma. Yeah, I think someone. <laughs> That's so silly. Very, uh, right? Yeah, yeah I, I. Whoever walks the Noble Eightfold Path, he has the true Dhamma. It doesn't matter yeah. where you live. Well, one one thing is is true, right? That uh, the, those so many of the those countries became like very uh, ritualistic or belief uh, places. Well, it's unavoidable because if uh, if uh, religion becomes uh, popular, not every person is able to grasp the uh, deep teachings of a religion, like uh, uh, the three characteristics and meditation. That requires but... somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat of a wise person to be interested in such things. But most people just want uh, religion to practice. So uh, the uh, 
people who are not uh, very wise they they are uh, you can say that uh, they are only practicing worshiping and yes. uh, those ceremonial things but that doesn't mean that is not beneficial such people are often very quick to pick up meditation oh yeah hmm. yeah the sort of person who really has an easy time with meditation it's like the missing piece they'll often say ah it was just the thing that i didn't couldn't figure out what was missing that's great it's the faith aspect Bhante, right because they don't doubt the teaching if you teach them to do it this way that way it's also the goodness aspect there's a lot of goodness in just listening to the dhamma and learning about good things and practicing good things or trying to like take a person who didn't know even about the five depths or didn't ever think about the importance of your actions on your mind and that sort of thing and didn't learn all these wholesome lessons and instead learned the sort of things that Christians, well, that's maybe not Christians, but Jewish people learn, for example, about the God who kills humans and stuff like that. Or in Hinduism, you learn from the Bhagavad Gita, so you get all you get skewed ideas that are out of line with the truth, and that makes it harder to practice because you lived your life that way. I, I the sin want to say documentaries or but i never see uh buddhism represented like really well like they do not really understand what is it about like i heard that oh buddhism is just uh worshiping multiple gods and things like that it, it's just so weird to me like it it's not even understood hinduism that's not buddhism yeah. Yeah. Well, there is no worshipping. Depends which part of the world, probably. Um, in a lot of places of the world, religion that people are familiar with is the Abrahamic religions, theistic religions. Uh, so they think they, they know very little about Buddhism because it's, they're not exposed to it. I agree with Edit. I also find that um, I'm, I'm miffed when people think that because I go to a Buddhist retreat, I practice samatha, and I, they all wish me a pleasant experience, and they think I engage in remembering desires, um, or cultivating powers, which is not at all what we do. I don't think people understand. Okay. And when you Google those things, that, that's what it really says. Mm -hmm. Well, that one plagues us for sure. The idea that meditation is meant to be, or is the practice of calming you down. I was talking a long time ago with someone trying to explain how meditation leads to knowledge. And they said, eh, meditation can maybe relax you, but it doesn't lead to knowledge. <laughs> okay. That, that misunderstanding plagues. I mean, it's part of, uh, part of, lots of conversations we have about mindfulness is trying to explain how it's different from stereotypical meditation. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about <clears throat> that aspect um, of what the meditation does. Uh, thinking about uh, <clears throat> um, the quote from last week, um, that the mind is the forerunner of our actions or deeds or and the quality of the mind um, dictates our inclinations but also what we do influences also the uh, the maintaining of that quality in one uh, aspect or, or the other but if you are living our life as we do on autopilot it's hard to um to cultivate a better 
mind state, but in the meditation, when we observe what happens, I think that helps us. Isn't that so? Yeah, that's a good way of describing the difference, the autopilot versus uh, a, a clarity. I mean, that's what the word vipassana means. Remember, it doesn't mean insight, it means seeing clearly, and that's a good explanation of what that phrase, seeing clearly, means. It's uh, having having less of the automatic habit-following behavior, having the capacity to respond based on the nature of the experience instead of based on your preconceived notions about it and that sort of thing, your views about it. Yes, uh, my, my job is really interesting in the sense we work with people with mental illnesses and uh, we try to put everything in place externally to get rid of the problems. Let's say someone's got schizophrenia, we get them a house that they don't have to pay for. We um, you know, they're not taking medications to keep them calm. Actually, uh, in a lot of cases, you put everything in place externally and it still doesn't help just one thing going wrong let's say uh somebody says something that they take offense in can just leave that person to wanting to kill themselves and then they get back right. into hospital so it's just the mind and the perceptions are the issue and no matter sometimes no matter what we do it just doesn't help yeah well it's a really neat uh not it's a terrible, but a neat example. Um, what are you trying to do? Not you, but but it's a good question to ask. What What is this system trying to do? I mean, it doesn't sound like they're trying to do anything. Mitigate or avoid, right? Which is what you're getting at. They're not actually doing anything because, I mean, the science tells you that this is what you do for it. You You find ways to skirt around the issue. I've, I've talked about this so many times now, but this article I read about a schizophrenic who learned to, in a sense, confront his uh, schizophrenia by finding ways to remind himself that that he, these are real, but they are real hallucinations. They are real thoughts in my mind. And he was able to um, I get to get a degree of some sort. He was told that he should try and find work at a gas station. That would probably be the best he could ever hope for. But uh, he was quite insightful and sounded somewhat mindful. He gave me the idea that schizophrenia might be a good candidate in some cases for mindfulness. I'm not so sure. I mean, it's so, it's so hard. The mind can be so one track that I think you'd need something fairly powerful in your mind, some great goodness. On the other hand, it's not a black and white thing, it's not binary, it's any anything good you can do for yourself helps. And I think schizophrenics are able to uh, cultivate mindfulness to some extent, even if they can't become enlightened in this life. I'm not sure that they can or can't, I'm just saying, even if they weren't able to. Um. Do, do you think the same for a sociopath or a borderline uh, disorder? I mean, borderline is not There's so bad. There's a lot bad. of problems with these terms, labels, right? I know. Yeah. Like the, this DSM, uh, really probably counterproductive. It's just people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> which is fairly harsh, but I think it has to be said that it is written by people who deep down don't know what they're talking about. They're, they're, they're misunderstanding things, from the sounds of it anyway. I've never read it, but it's very uh, much about uh, um, 
naming something. If it's in the manual or if it's not in the manual. So, like, um, the interesting thing about sociopaths or psychopaths is the, the, the conception is that they have no potential for, let's say, compassion, or they have no potential to feel bad about the things that they do. And apparently studies of psych sociopaths or psych psychopaths is, show that that's not true. So it's just a word. Mm -hmm. And the reality is often more complex. There's a, I'm more interested if uh, they are still, I don't know, like diagnosed people who who try that out uh, meditation and uh, they, so let's say, succeeded or benefit from? Well, well, to some extent, a lot of these things dovetail with um, with evil. And so you mm -hmm. you have you're kind of in a way part of what your question is is about how how responsive evil people are to meditation. And the answer is always going to be not very. So to the mm -hmm. extent that there's evil associated with it, like a sociopath, of course, is part of what that means to call someone that is that they have evil tendencies. They they are inclined towards cruelty, and their mind is quite perverse. Same with addicts. Uh, so the question of whether addicts can respond to meditation, it often, people miss the point when they ask those, not you, but people when they ask those, non-Buddhists when they ask those questions, miss the point that it's evil. <laughs> An addict is a person who's engaging in evil. So yeah, that's going to get in the way for sure. Makes it harder. Mm -hmm. The best meditators are not the ones who need it the most because we perceive evil people as needing it the most, right? Good people are so. There's you hear talks or read books by Buddhists about how meditation isn't just about to make how to make you normal. It's about how to make you noble, how to make you 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 a great person, not just ordinary, not to get you back to a state of ordinary. This is something that a lot of people coming into meditation don't realize because they just want to get back to normal. I mean, to some extent. Normal we, people we look at as normal are not very normal, right? They're not very. Well, their minds are not very normal, but um, a person who is truly with a normal mind is quite exceptional. So there's a certain amount of exceptionalism. I don't know what that word exactly means, but basic something like that. Uh, in in a person who practices meditation, the idea is striving for something higher, something great. And so the best people are those who are already good people. That should be the, really the target. And, and it's not exclusionary. It just means if if people, they'll help people who are not so good. It, it's more efficient that way. I guess they are too far gone then. Like, I feel like you're saying that there's no hope. Or maybe it's... Um, no, I'm not We can't that. say it. It's inefficient to focus on such people out of mm -hmm. out of hand. So if you think, wow, I should just go and try and teach, I should focus on teaching meditation to addicts or psychopaths or schizophrenics. Sure, you're, it's probably not sustainable. You'll get burnt out, you'll get overwhelmed, you'll end up quit quitting. You might get into trouble mm -hmm. because, you know, one of them might attack you or, you know, there's just so many so many different things that can happen when you go to that end of the spectrum that um, it doesn't turn out to most of the time be the right way, but it, it generally happens more that you're approached by someone who is schizophrenic. If you you know put yourself in a position where you're teaching people meditation, okay. you'll often be approached by them. And, you know, then it's, I, I, I would, I mean, that's the thing is you do help such people. You help whoever comes and, Oftentimes, meditation centers attract people who have severe issues, and so you're always going to be in the meditation center. I think, to some extent, you're always going to be confronted with this, and turning them away is wrong. Uh, making rules about only accepting the best people is not the point of what I was saying at all. Um, but uh, it's just maybe a remark that the best people are going to be the best people. So when uh, when you went to 
uh, teach people in the prison, um, it, that was uh, not at all useful. Or, I mean, the problem with probably... that prison is is not um, mon is not uh, monolithic. Everybody in prison is going to have their own story. But the problem with what I was yeah. doing is it wasn't a prison. It was a pre-trial detention center. So it was a specific problem that they were, everyone, almost without exception, was fixated on their trial. They hadn't been convicted yet. And so their minds were not in it. It's pretty clear. Some of them were gang members. I mean, it was federal as well, so it was a lot of drug and tax evasion. Um, but uh, a lot of them were gang members who took the opportunity of the meditation session to sit and talk to each other about whatever, their trial or, or gang stuff, I don't know. So it was a bit of a kerfuffle. Yeah, it's good to know that, uh, yeah, that, that, they they might not might not be interested. But I, I think, think I heard that. No, I think the point is that a prison would be is generally thought of as a good place to teach because of the mind state of the individuals. People tend to oh, yeah, prisons are hit and miss and can be horrible. Are I think quite often horrible places. But I think there's room for a sort of uh, letting go. Some of the people were joking about if I could teach them to fly, so they could they could fly out of the prison. I yeah, I, I saw. Someone asked me that. I think someone asked me that. I, I saw a documentary with Goenka. I don't know his last name, or that's his last name. I don't know. <clears throat> so he they started this whole Goenka practice in in prison, and uh, few few of the uh, people did uh, stay with the meditation, kept it up. Also, the Buddha himself advised the monk, it goes as Charata Bhikkhu, Charakam, Bahujana Hitaya, Bahujana Sukhaya. So, if uh, somebody with mental illness is taking up all your time, not probably worth it. You have to. Uh, be results oriented. I, mean, I think um, working with such people is sort of more of a measure of where you are. I don't think as a monk it's where you should be, but um, as a meditation teacher, let's say, you would generally, I think, more teach people who might work in prisons. Like a chaplain should, a prison chaplain should uh, know, should should teach meditation for sure. But uh, I don't think I'm really inclined towards it personally. But the thing about a prison chaplain is it's it's often a paid job, and so um, a person who who uh, who's working in the world might think of that as a good occupation, an opportunity to do something good and make a livelihood. So I think the kind of thing I could imagine someone who I taught meditation may be going out and sharing it with prisoners. Um, yeah, I think school teachers can, can apply. And I, that's sort of what we're doing with the mentorship program, talking to people about how they can bring, bring it yeah. to their... My team works with addicts and, you know, a variety of mental health illnesses, pretty much everything. So I I, I speak to people with serious uh, mental health illnesses and um, addiction issues, um, um, you know, pretty much, yeah, very regularly, sometimes every day. And maybe I oversimplify it, but what I notice that tends, you know, that makes me think, some of them might be, you know, might succeed if they tried meditation, mindfulness specifically, or some of them couldn't. Is um, just you notice the hindrances. Like some of them, you try to speak to them for five minutes and they just can't sit down. You know, they want to leave the room, they want to go and smoke a cigarette. So you think actually 
there's no way you can meditate if you can't sit down, you know, for two minutes uh, continuously, not really. So it just, uh, it varies, but um, you do notice, it seems like more, there's a lot of restlessness, for example, more than the average person has. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds bad. Like, I don't think I ever met a person who can st sit for two minutes. They exist. Maybe children. <laughs> I met children who can sit. Maybe more common in young people. Old people start to learn, but well, she, I'm sure, knows more yeah. extreme examples. I mean, I've seen people who aren't that bad, but have meant clear, meant clear ADHD, that sort of thing. Tried to meditate, can't sit still for even a minute. Yes. And you know, if those people are really interested, um, they can they can learn, and I'm sure they can make progress. But they would have to maybe work harder than other people who don't have. Um, well, well, yeah, when the hindrances aren't that, um, I guess, enormous. Well, you hit a very important word: if they're interested. Yeah, I mean, that's crucial. That that really is the linchpin. Because if someone is interested, it doesn't matter what their mental illness is. I mean, they're going to gain from it. I mean, how much they gain is still, there's other factors, but that's the issue. So many people are not interested in meditation. I'm thinking this one person in particular, I, um, I tried to teach him meditation, but uh, he was interested. But he couldn't do it. So it's not the only thing. Um, but another factor is going to be um, the teacher, the, the, the resources that they have. So in like in the example that you present or we pr or present, we're talking about um, a person who can't sit still for a minute. Uh, as we all know, mindfulness isn't just about sitting still. So finding ways to describe what it means to be mindful without requiring them to sit still can really make a big difference. Once they get the concept of it, instead of just starting with sitting still, because again, sitting still, what do we think of? Well, the mind is calm. When my mind is not calm, I must be doing something wrong. But you approach it from a different perspective, the right perspective. Don't Sitting down isn't the point. You approach it from the point of being mindful. So when you walk around, say to yourself, walking, walking, or try to say right, left. When you feel pain, when you're anxious, when you're restless, just say to yourself, restless or anxious. Uh, and, and impress upon them that the point is not to stop being restless or to stop uh, feeling anxious or to suddenly calm down. It's just meant to not be so much on autopilot, right? And can help them get a better perspective on things like sitting meditation. I met one person with schizophrenia who was interesting in the sense they they try to control their mind with love. You know, they said, I just think about love all day and that's how I cope with it. And I just thought it would, it would be nice if you could switch, you know, from that mantra into something else. But even speaking to him, he would keep repeating love, right. anything that's saved. So uh, I thought maybe if you tried to tweak what you're doing into right mindfulness, that could work for you. Yeah, I mean, again, are they interested? Exactly. But, but the other thing, another thing is um, samatha meditation, which we can roughly say that that's what they were doing, is easier and more um, safer to, uh, to some extent. It can be quite dangerous in other ways, but it can be safer because uh, you don't have to confront things. So for a schizophrenic, say, having to face the mind is a much more challenging thing than an ordinary, a person who is like, neurotypical, is that what you call it, ordinary, who doesn't have schizophrenia. The paranoia, right? The paranoia is apparently overwhelming, such that facing it is a monumental task. So, 
how they how they get around how they get about doing that i would imagine it involves um practically speaking it involves taking medication to dull the things like paranoia and slowly being weaned off of it I, i'm interested and i may be completely off base but i'm interested in the idea of weaning someone off of medication while teaching them meditation and of course the problem with that is I can't do that. You can't come to me and I tell you, okay, now take less medication. I can get in serious trouble for doing that. Uh, so, in Canada, anyway. If I was in Sri Lanka, I'd go for it. But not here. Uh, what What are these medication uh, doing to, to the brain, I guess? I don't yeah, really they, understand. They dull, they, they, dull they, they maintain a sense of euphoria sometimes. They... They prevent, it's like a drug. They prevent brain pleasant brain. I mean, there are different kinds, but generally, they the SSRIs. I think right. They prevent the pleasant stuff or the calming stuff from getting taken back up. So they're constantly in your system. Uh, so you're constantly in a state of sort of okayness, and you can feel it. You feel kind of like you're suppressing. I mean, she probably knows her. There's people here who know more than I do. Um, medication is not my area of expertise, but yes, a lot of it um, is just your, you know, kind of like your dopamine levels are always at a particular, you know, an average person might have different hormonal fluctuations, whereas they just keep them at the same so that even if your something happens, you can't, your brain can't, you know, chemically, chemically get to that point where you feel sad and it's, uh, yeah, very odd actually. You're almost forced to be in the same mood. Yeah, you can feel it. it. Apparently, you can feel how it's artificial. It doesn't yeah, feel. Yeah, I wanted to say the opposite. Like it sounds, it sounds like if if you're just keeping a dopamine level up, it sounds like it's it could be called natural, but then it isn't. Bante, no, you're saying feels, the I mean, exact it feels opposite. very. They say things like it uh, feels like it's just covering everything up, but I think Chi actually explained it in a way that I'd never heard it explained as better. Is that you're not able, your brain is just not able to get sad or anxious or whatever, afraid. So it feels kind of impotent in a sense, is probably a little, I mean, I've never experienced it, but probably more yeah, accurate. That, Monte, is that, it safe uh, for the brain? Chemicals or the, the drug, the yes, medication? the drug, the mint. I don't know. I, I imagine it's probably not entirely safe. There's lots of side effects. I've talked with, I, I was uh, very, very close proximity to a monk who was taking these medications and different medications, and he said they all have side effects. Okay. He was experiencing, they were having to change medications because he would have this side effect or that side effect, physical side effects, even mental side effects. I mean, they don't really work to fix anything. I don't think anybody is under the illusion that they fix anything. Okay. But oh, so. uh, they're much more they're much more problematic for the mind because they um, they cultivate the habit of avoidance. They become a crutch, and you become more and more unable to face, unwilling to face, and so. Probably a lot of the problem, I was talking with the schizophrenic about his paranoia, he said, I just can't, it's just too strong. Probably a lot of that had to do with his long-term taking of medication. He's just at the point now where it's so scary to have to face, it's just not able to, I mean, it becomes worse, more overwhelming to have to face it. I, I would think, I actually don't have a lot of experience. Thank you. That's so the problem. That's the problem because uh, I feel like I could not help such a person because I never even taken any of this, so I well, don't the, know. The thing to know is that they're avoiding, and that's what you what what really makes it hard to teach mindfulness, and it's what often makes them what makes people upset that we mm -hmm. won't accept them because they think, of course, I can meditate. I mean, it's just about feeling calm, right? But no. 
mindfulness meditation is about facing your experiences, facing your issues, which is the exact opposite of what you're doing on medication. So besides mm -hmm. the whole not being able to experience things naturally, which is going to get in the way, but I would say more fundamental is just you're never going to get to the point unless you're willing to slowly wean yourself off of it, which would be a great thing. It would be so great if we could, but people are horrified when I suggest even playing such doc playing doctor in such a way, like because I have no certification and I, I'm yeah I, I accept mm -hmm. that I don't know much about these things, but I don't think they're that complicated. Just slowly wean yourself off of them. Meditation is powerful, but tell that to anyone, they'll be horrified. People who are not Buddhist, I've talked to people about that who just thought I was like Dr. Javago or something. But what about coffee? A lot of people argue that it's good and it keeps you focused. I don't know. Well, again, it's a crutch. So that's going to be problematic. Something people like, they like the feeling, and they start to like the taste, they like the smell. The feeling of coffee is, can be really pleasant, especially in the beginning. I think after you take it every day, it kind of wears off a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I drank caffeine recently for the first time in a really long time. And... Um, I didn't drink coffee, but yeah, I drank caffeine, and like the my my mood was just like so much better. It it was crazy. I, I had to take, I kind of had to take some because I was driving at, at night and I was really tired. But yeah, I mean, I know it's not the worst thing, but yeah, I was kind of I was gonna ask that about about it as well. It was like. I don't want to. I don't want to use it as a. I don't want it to hinder my progress. But I feel like um, there's maybe a place where I, I think if you, well, I, I guess I'm just parroting uh, Bonte. I believe you, you said that you, you understand when when people in the world have to take it, and sometimes I feel like it, like it would like like um, like in a roundabout way it would. Uh, it would be helpful for me because I have so many worldly things. And it yeah, gives you coffee, is, coffee is actually quite, sorry, it's actually quite a good tool in a worldly sense. I absolutely prescribe it if you need to or that sort of thing. Just try and use it when you need it. It can be a temporary, temporary aid for for people in the world. And then, I don't know, like, after I take it, I'm like, or after I drank it, I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to be meditating. I guess I won't be, I guess I won't meditate for a while now because I'm under the influence of this. No, you know? I wouldn't. I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I said I Dr. Actually... Can I just make a correction? I said Dr. Zavago. I meant Dr. Kevorkian. That's the one I was thinking about. It's the guy who killed people or assisted people to kill themselves, I think. So just keep trying to be mindful, or keep just to still be mindful, even if you have caffeine in your system. Oh yeah, for sure. I it suppose. doesn't stop you from being mindful. It might get in the way a little bit, but not to any appreciable degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes you a little bit restless. Not a little bit, restless, for sure. But if you keep noting it... Mm -hmm. I think it also hits different people differently. But yeah, just note the experiences. I have to go, so thank you all. Have a good week. Yeah. Sahadu. Thank you, Bante. Sahadu. Thank you, Bante. Oh.